Hello, everybody. My name is John Stamatikos. I'm a member of the Committee of Geological and, Geo Geological and Geotechnical Engineering at the National Academy of Sciences, and I am the moderator for today's webinar. Um, briefly, COGI is a standing committee of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine um, under the Board of Earth Sciences and Resources. We were established as the focal point within the National Academies for government, industry, and academia on technical and public policy issues related to earth processes and materials, soil and rock mechanics, responsible human development, and mitigation of natural and human hazards. If you have questions about CAGA, please contact Sam Maxino at the National Academy Staff Direct. She's the National Academy Staff Director of our committee. This webinar is part of our webinar series presented by Kagi through the support of the National Science Foundation. And the webinar will be posted on YouTube uh, soon after the recording today, and we will send out an announcement when it is available. Um, open your chat from, for messages from the speakers during the, during the discussion, and uh, we will post the bios of the speakers in that chat feature. We'll have time for Q&A after the panelists give their talks. Uh, audience can submit their questions using the Q&A tab on the Zoom part of the screen. So if you have questions, take advantage of that feature of Zoom. We will answer, pose and answer as many questions as possible as time permits during our discussion at the end of this webinar. It's important for me to give a disclaimer. So any opinions, conclusions, or recommendations expressed by the panelists or anyone during this webinar, and those of the individuals <clears throat> uh, do not represent conclusions or recommendations of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, or Medicine. As we mentioned, Sam Magasino is organizing this. She's working with Sam Kraft in the background to make sure that everything runs smoothly. So let me introduce briefly our, our speakers. Our first speaker is going to be George Gustja. George is president and CEO of the National Institute of Building Sciences. Cece Nicolau, she's the lead NCST investigator at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in this. And uh, Ron Aguchi, he's CEO and co-founder of ImageCat, founding chair of the Lifeline Infrastructure Hubs. So today's uh, webinar, Strategies for Resilient Lifeline Infrastructures. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ron. Good afternoon, and thank you for this opportunity to discuss lifeline infrastructure and its impacts to a resilient built environment. I'm especially delighted to be here with Samantha, who participated in our inaugural Lifelines Hub workshop, and with John for his leadership in bringing this important issue to the forefront. Uh, this is a topic that was first introduced to me when I was a cadet at West Point, and it's been so impactful in my personal and, and professional life that it was a large focus during uh, both my master's studies at Oxford and my doctoral work here in GW. Um, I, I wanted to start off with just a, a little bit about that personal journey. Uh, my professional career started in medical facilities and systems. So the vertical environment is specific to uh, you know, medical facilities. Um, but it has progressed over the years to the heavy civil lifeline portfolio, uh, especially heavy in water and transportation with some energy mixed in. Um, and, and that's because of five very formative experiences that very much brought uh, awareness in, you know, of, of the importance of lifeline infrastructure. You know, the, the first was when I was an active duty Medical Service Corps officer in Kosovo. Uh, during the 2002 uh, Jelani uh, earthquakes, it was a 5.7 uh, magnitude earthquake. And uh, it introduced me to the need for resilient lifeline uh, infrastructure. It was very much um, something that, that I had not previously been aware of. Um, and then from there in 2003 as a brigade engineer and then as a national uh, director for health facilities in Iraq, um, it, it was, uh, again, very apparent how interconnected Lifeline's infrastructure was and how essential it was. Um, then 
Later on, I uh, went back to Iraq uh, with the Corps of Engineers as a civil servant, working on a billion dollar reconstruction program. And then uh, from there, uh, in the private sector, I was working with MWH, now Stantec, and I was the last private sector program manager um, for the New Orleans recovery program after you know the uh, Hurricane Katrina. And again, witnessed firsthand the impacts that lifeline infrastructure, when it is not uh, addressed quickly, and you have the uh, quickest functional recovery after event, how that cascades later on and through the years. And then finally, um, I was a, uh, a volunteer uh, chief of party for Project Hope uh, after the 2011 uh, Tohoku earthquake and tsunami in Japan. Um, there, I, I, I saw again firsthand what impacts uh, the lifeline infrastructure has, especially when you have entire buildings, entire subdivisions that are lifted up and then sent down uh, stream from where the surge has, uh, you know, came in. So you now have entire communities that have been separated from the lifeline infrastructure that had previously uh, been supporting it. I wanted to start a, a little bit with uh, some information about the National Institute of Building Sciences, especially our link to the National Academies of Sciences. You know, in many ways, I was, uh, I, I, I found reading our enabling legislation that um, it was always uh, part of the vision of Congress that the National Academy of Sciences um, as a research, uh, uh, Institute and, and one that advances human knowledge, that they would have someone to help support as the applied research, the uh, the application of the advancement within the domain of the, the built environment and for the public interest. And, and that is what we do. We are that bridge. So um, enabled by Congress in 1974, the National Institute was charged with identifying, um, evaluating and advancing applied building science and technologies for the public interest. And one of the ways that we accomplish our mission is by convening the leaders of the public and private sectors of the built environment to explore innovations of today and what can and will significantly impact our future and to identify spotlight and be part of solutioning um, the critical issues of the day, and that is very much uh, inclusive of Lifeline's infrastructure. So just a, a couple example projects that you may have uh, heard of uh, in this space. You know, the, the first one is um, the, uh, the, the first one is a natural hazard mitigation saves report. I think many people may be aware of this. Um, this was a, a, a long-standing report it has been uh, refreshed over the years. I think the, the very first time I ran across it was in 2005. And back then, it was one, uh, the, the ratio was one to five is what I, I first read it. Um, and the whole idea is that we, uh, using you know, the, the data available and the analysis, have shown that for lifeline retrofits, the, the report details the benefits in that ratio. And you can see the different types of, uh, of events and then um, the impact of taking certain steps to that ratio. So it becomes readily apparent that it is incredibly beneficial to, um, uh, to our society if we take a look at how we invest pre-disaster, pre-event, so that we can post event, make sure that we have um, a more resilient community that can um, withstand and then uh, and, and recover quickly after the event. Um, in many ways, this mitigation saves report is very much a foundation document for us that helps us guide how we look at and, and um, and apply the various advances that have come uh, forward through the years. A um, more specific uh, study that we have done is uh, this Portland Resilient Runway Benefit Cost Analysis. So in, in this uh, specific report, we looked at um, in, in 2021, what 
the renovation of the Portland International Airport one way um, using certain mitigation and, uh, you know, uh, advances and, and interventions, what, what would be the impact of that? And you can see for yourself on the slide that there is an incredibly outsized benefit, a, uh, a, a huge return for every dollar that is spent to increase the resiliency of this type of infrastructure. So when we talk about lifeline infrastructure, um, it is very much the challenges that come of a complex system of complex systems. And I, I wanted to kind of introdu uh, introduce that, that uh, topic today and also a few examples of steps forward that have been taken in 2024. So when we look at a system of systems and many of you are already aware of, um, of, of what that means, um, and then we look through that lens at Lifeline's infrastructure, we can see very, very quickly that because of the fragmented nature of many of the Lifeline infrastructure elements, you know, the various utilities, the various subsystems, and, and the fact that Lifeline's infrastructure often pass through many, many dur uh, different jurisdictions. You may be aware that in the United States, there's 19,000 different jurisdictions that have variations of different codes and standards. So not having a standard, uh, not having a, an authority to integrate, synchronize, prioritize, plan, measure, control across these lifeline systems, that is a major, major challenge. And then within each of the lifeline systems, again, as a standalone complex system, what we find is a diverse and complex, very fragmented in some cases, uh, you know, system or utility. Um, we, we have seen that uh, they have very diverse organizational structures. Um, a, a lot of times as you go through the U.S., you find uh, major regional variances, uh, very different operating models, very different governance structures. However, as different and complex as all these systems are, um, they are very much interconnected. And so the, the key highlight here is that our current Lifelines infrastructure is marked by fragility, um, a great interconnected fragility versus the resiliency that the public needs. And so if we wish to protect lives, livelihoods, and our communities, what we need to do is recognize the integrated dependencies that uh, exist pre-event and take mitigation measures that lead to a more resilient uh, Lifelines infrastructure post-event and understand and try to prevent the cascading failures that often happen. One of the ways that we have approached this, and, and you will hear uh, more in depth about this Lifeline Infrastructure Hub uh, from Ron later on in this webinar, is to convene together. One of the things that Congress has asked us to do is convene the public sector, the private sector, industry and academia together. And this is what Lifeline Infrastructure Hub does. The goals and objectives are very much in line with our mission, which um, is in the public interest to always, in the public interest, bring together for our communities, how do we look at um, the public and private sector coming together, bridging together so that they can effectively uh, deal with the issues of the day. We convene coalitions to identify these types of issues, to look in depth at each of the fundamental issues that, uh, that need to be addressed, and then build consensus solutions, create roadmaps and prioritize from advancement to action. And by doing that, what we can do then is look at lifeline resilience through legislation. And I just posted a couple uh, examples of that that you can read very quickly. Thank you. I just want to take this moment again on behalf of the National Institute of Building Sciences to thank Samantha, John, Sissy, and Ron for their leadership and excellence and personal commitment to this. And um, I will be followed uh, by uh, Dr. Nicolau, thank you.
Thank you, George. And um, many thanks to the National Academies and the Committee on Geological and Geotechnical Engineering for um, this invitation. Um, I would like to go straight to the uh, opportunities that we uh, as geo professionals have in this domain and uh, the many challenges ahead of us. So um, based on what George clearly stated, this is a very complex problem that involves um, a lot of different systems, different ownerships, um, and a system of systems and a hazard of hazards uh, type of, of uh, problems. And what has been identified by the President's National Infrastructure Advisory Committee as the main barriers or recommendations to improve and protect critical infrastructure um, are these three points. So one is that we do not have clear metrics and science-based targets for resilient lifelines. We don't have um, clear business cases that make the, the business case of resilience that could help incentivize financing and reduction in um, insurance premiums. And we have not developed well public-private collaboration. We are all in this together and we need to work together in um, resolving the issues of, um, uh, of our resilient infrastructure. So where we are with codes is that um, in extreme events, and what I'm showing here is for earthquakes, but it applies in general for extreme events, is that um, we are looking at the state of a building that looks like that after an earthquake, and that would characterize it as life safety, which means um, nothing more than the building is going to give you the chance of getting out of it alive. It does not guarantee that you could return back to that building. Actually, you have a risk, a percentage, 1% in 50 years. That you, might, um, uh, you might have a collapse of that, um, that building. So it, it can take a very long time to go back. And we all experienced from the pandemic how important it is uh, to return back to our normal. As geotechnical engineers, we know very well that um, we have been um, using codes that have are relying on very uncertain uh, parameters. Uh, but as Puller said in the foundations manual, um, codes of practice um, are good. They begin with good intention, but they could constrain innovation and ingenuity, and they could become the only basis of acceptable design. Uh, so can we do and should we do better than that? Absolutely. Uh, so where where do we see um, the um, main um, members of, of this committee and on, on this webinar? Where is um, the role of geoprofessionals? First of all, it's an exciting new frontier that can give us um, innovation. And we thrive for that. Um, we also, um, it's a new way of designing where everything is leaning towards. We cannot stay at this isolated asset by asset type of codes and standards to design. We have to think more globally. And finally, I think with respect to uh, commodity, uh, commod uh, the, the risk of uh, our profession becoming a com commodity, we need to claim leadership in this domain with purpose in order to have a decision uh, making a uh, vote in the table where decisions are being made. What are the drivers to, um, to make this change in our uh, mindset? is um, you know, a demographics. There is uh, obviously a global urbanization increase, which shows that our planet becomes um, bigger and bigger, and our population is going to be moving more and more to big cities. Now, this is a very recent map from the New York Times that shows that Americans move um, in thousands and tens of thousands in the past uh, 20 years, to hotspots for hurricanes, um, wildfires uh, and floods, 
because their decision making is not based on the potential for disasters in these areas, but rather if they could have a better job opportunity, lower cost of living, better views, and um, better climate in general. So if an extreme event that um, would happen 20 years ago would not be significant, if it happens today or in the immediate future, it could become a disaster because of the denser populations in these areas. Um, the other thing is that we cannot think of hazards as isolated events anymore uh, with extreme climate. This is an um, example of uh, Turkey in Syria a year ago, the, the huge earthquakes uh, that happened there, uh, that had important geotechnical effects, including landslides. But also, as you can see, I hope in the video from NPR, what happened after, immediately after the earthquakes uh, were flash floods that created um, massive losses as well. So we cannot think single hazard, single asset anymore. We also have um, a very large infrastructure gap, and I'm showing here just data from 2023 from FHWA in the American Society of Civil Engineers uh, for bridges in particular, that shows that yearly the estimated costs for repairs are in the order of 220 billion, where the funds committed to rehabilitation is about 100 times more than that. So um, this is the gap. We need to close it. It doesn't get any better with time, and especially when looking at um, insurance um, data. And these are global data that I'm referring to here. Um, I, I, I assume they might be worse after there is a major um, hurricanes we had. But in the last 20 years in emerging markets, um, in, in advanced economies, only 30% of floods have been covered by insurance. So that's a major issue. So um, in 2021, uh, my agency, NIST with FEMA, published um, a report at the request of Congress on um, a new concept where it can take us to a functional recovery state after an extreme event. Um, again, the example is for earthquake, where we say that functional recovery is a post-earthquake performance state in which a building or infrastructure system is maintained or restored safely to support basic intended functions pre-event use. And of course, the acceptable time, it, it varies by building use and lifeline service. Now, for life, see an analogy, you see no functionality on the left and full functionality on the right, where we we should be aiming at with functional recovery is the third uh, option that you see, where you have a combination of redundancy, alternative routes, but also partial um, partial traffic within the main uh, highway system. And we have seen examples of that, like earlier this year, we had um, an earthquake, a major earthquake in Japan, and you see a um, no functionality example post earthquake and a functional recovery example. Of course, um, for all of us geotechs uh, on this meeting, um, this um, image on the right has to be done safely to ensure that life safety and safety of transport is followed. And of course, um, recovery is not a one way street. It has to do with many different phases that we can control. We have to reimagine how we respond to extreme events. This is an example uh, from Sri Lanka, from the World Bank, on how their highway system uh, recovers based on different decisions and investments. And it can be a very long period of time that impacts the economy. This example is for uh, almost a year. So uh, how can we move to the new mindset of functional recovery? Uh, we need to connect engineering to economics. And I know we don't all love doing that, but it's a must. And in reality, usually we have a fixed budget, right? And the question that we want to answer is, how can I optimize my um, investment so I can, I, can, I can get the best functional recovery for this lifeline system? or 
I cover um, a functional recovery time for the network in my mind, and I want to optimize my investments. So we have to add to the physical damage and to just simple downtime, other things that have to do with productivity, overtime of transporters, carbon emissions, operating expenses, very important freight claims, and um, gas consumption. All of these add to the risk, the way that we have been dealing with risk so far, and they reflect also um, the case for the return on investments that George showed earlier from NIBS and how we can make the business case for investing in resilience. So for doing that, you know that um, a lot of this return on investment um, assume that the, the extreme event has happened, the one in a 100-year flood, the one in 2,500-year earthquake has happened. And that oftentimes to decision makers or to clients seems like a very long-term goal. So um, it would be great to have everything um, uh, projected to an average annual, annual loss, which is nothing more than the product of the total uh, direct or indirect plus the indirect network losses in the, um, for the hazard we are looking at or for multi-hazard, even better times the annual probability of this event to happen. That product is going to give us an average annual loss. So at least we have created a, a methodology and a tool called RESIST, it's about to be released, um, that uh, tries to, to answer these two questions that I posed by optimizing the annual average, average losses. And what you see here, an example of 316 million for um, a portion of a highway in the West Coast, and what you see interesting here, here on the bottom right on the pie chart, you can see how small the physical damage is compared to all these other things that include the lost person hours, which is a major contribution, as well as a logistic uh, costs that are also a big chunk of this. So the total lo annual losses for this particular scenario, which is a seven and a half earthquake nearby in the San Andreas Fault. Uh, you see in space, uh, all of these losses differ. The physical damage could be more red in some other portions of the system versus the other damages that are also spatially distributed. So um, what we need to do in order to look at the system of systems approach is to use um, to use algorithms, heuristic algorithms and uh, large data and AI to be able to simulate our investments at all the assets and look at the overall outcome of functional recovery as an index of resilience. What I, we have seen is that um, with a simple mind of a human, uh, we can um, uh, invest on the riskiest assets. But there is a point of saturation in this investment where the asset is not giving you back much in terms of functional recovery or even safety. So you're better off distributing this investment. And this is what we do with these algorithms that help us a lot to simulate traffic. And in the simple example, example I was showing, just uh, using uh, we found that the most optimal solution in, the case, in this case was to use seismic isolation bearings and steel jacks and invest 20 million. And what we would get in a horizon of 20 years um, projections in terms of annual reduction is 92 million. These are very, very important. This a total annual reduction is very, very important because it's money that um, ASC president Maria Lehman, she calls them magic money, is a money that you can put either save them, but better invest it in the network to enhance its regular use, its maintenance and extend its life cycle going back to this big infrastructural gap. It's not just for the hazards, it's also for daily use. So um, this is also applicable. We have seen it in cases for flooding uh, where we have a lot more contributions from um, 
the geotechnical community, where we we can have um, this is um, um, an example from a countrywide application in Pakistan uh, by the World Bank using the resist methodology, where you see that uh, in the in the extreme uh, flood scenario, uh, you have the need to do major uh, investments to um, to um, protect from scour, from failure of foundations, from widening the river itself, road rehabilitation, protecting from landslides and things like that. There is um, uh, the, the, the low regret intervention uh, on the right, the blue one, is the one that reflects more frequent but lower level uh, flood events. That could be erosion control, road drainage, relief or openings. They cost less, but they happen, these events happen more frequently. So um, if you compare the two, the same way I compared um, the annual losses, um, the, uh, the, the the benefits, when you look at it in return, it's it's important. When you go with the less intense flood, that is going to happen over and over and over again. And you still have the magic money that you can invest on the network in um, an horizon of investment of 50 years. What you see is that the benefit um, in both plants is more or less the same in absolute number, but the return on investment is significantly bigger on the low regret interventions. And a lot of times it's common sense interventions and the return on investments is, is very appealing to bring public private contracts in this uh, domain. So uh, when we look at um, the charts by uh, FEMA and by NIBS on return on investment, what we see is that um, for cases we have already looked at for earthquake and floods, you know, these numbers could be multiple times bigger when you are approaching it that way. And that means that we can make a better case of investing in this and thinking differently and innovating. So in closing, I would like to just have some um, uh, some thoughts that I hope you can uh, think about where where you fit in, in this um future, actually, it's, it's the present, and that investing in uh, lifeline resilience to functional recovery is obvious because it's something that that works, and maybe it's the only way forward. Uh, incentives um, uh, such as reduction of insurance or return on investments could attract investments and financing in this domain. Public and private stakeholders have the choice, but we also have a social responsibility to think beyond code that of course ensures life safety, but looks at functional recovery as a life quality objective, in my opinion. Reimagining risk, losses, and design criteria, considering system of systems, multi-hazard climate change through recovery and financial metrics, engineering innovation can optimize and incentivize these investments. And uh, finally, advancing decision support frameworks and new standards require some dot connector that will act as a central location of data, guidelines of all these different systems and, and know-how resources. And I think Ron is going to talk uh, more about that. Finally, I think that geoprofessionals are uniquely positioned to lead efforts for beyond code system-based designs that can balance integrity, equity, efficiency in administering funds and embed sustainability in infrastructure investments. So the ball is in our court, and I hope we can all think of how we can move our practices forward to uh, include this systematic approach for critical lifeline. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much and uh, pass it on to my colleague, uh, Rone Gucci. Ron? Thank you, Sissy, and uh, <clears throat> a great presentation. So good morning, good afternoon. Um, I'm very pleased to be here with everybody. Um, 
I want to start off with um, uh, something. The thing is, guys, that our lifelines uh, are getting very old. A lot of them are over 100 years old. And uh, what that means is that uh, a lot of them uh, require a lot of maintenance. They become more vulnerable to things like uh, natural disasters. And then the other things, if you think about it, um, our disasters are becoming much more severe. They're more frequent. And so when you think about both of these things, you know, you've got kind of a perfect storm. You know, we really got some very vulnerable uh, lifelines infrastructure. And I think it's extremely imperative that we begin to think about things that we can do to make our lifelines and, and ultimately our communities much more resilient. So what I'm going to uh, cover today, there are two uh, two main areas. Um, we've heard um, some some great uh, uh, thoughts and ideas from both George and Sissy uh, about how we can essentially measure, you know, the value of uh, mitigation measures that we uh, uh, use for uh, for lifeline systems. What I want to do is I want to emphasize, I think, a very very important tool that we can use to help quantify current uh, resilience levels. Uh, and also how we can use it to uh, essentially evaluate the uh, the effectiveness uh, of different mitigation measures. So I'm going to talk about uh, simulation methods. And some of the things I want to cover, uh, which I think are very important, are things like system performance criteria. We need these in order for us to uh, sort of set the targets of what that performance for the system should be. I'll talk about an example where we use simulation methods to uh, to measure performance and then ultimately how that affects, you know, restoration times or at least uh, our targeting, uh, you know, what we'd like to have. And then I'd like to just follow up on some things that George uh, started with, uh, with the, the NIBS Lifeline Infrastructure Hub and how important that is, you know, to have an initiative, have uh, the ability and the entity to move things forward uh, once we begin to focus on things like metrics and, and measurements. So I want to start off acknowledging I, uh, somebody that was very important to me, uh, Professor Martin Duke. Uh, he is often uh, referred to as the father of lifeline earthquake engineering. Uh, he taught at UCLA. And one of the things that uh, he uh, tried to do after the, uh, the 1971 San Fernando earthquake, uh, which, uh, sorry, excuse me, let me get this thing. Uh, was to uh, begin to get people to think about uh, moving beyond just trying to limit damage to these types of systems, but to begin to uh, look at ensuring serviceability. So he came up with this idea of setting performance goals uh, to measure the performance of lifelines. And they would include things like, you know, trying to make sure that the, the maximum percent of service population uh, is with service within certain periods of time, times uh, to to try to uh, minimize the maximum duration of outage, and then also to to look at the full restoration of service, you know, to these systems. And I think the important thing here is that you know when you begin to think about um, criticality, system criticality, the size of the event, and the type of lifeline system, these measures all may may uh, may differ. You may assign uh, these levels to uh, to different conditions. Now, more recently, Craig Davis, a uh, colleague of mine, has uh, expanded on this notion of system performance, and he's done this in a number of uh, different ways. Uh, he's um, added the notion of hazard size and and frequencies. Uh, in other words, you know, as the the hazard or the event becomes much more severe or more frequent, then you know maybe the uh, the performance targets will change. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, if you think about uh, the level two 500 year return period event, uh, what Craig is uh, considering are things that, for example, you add in life safety, property protection, but you begin to think about operational levels uh, uh, that might uh, vary depending upon whether you provide um, 
uh, full service, maybe partial service. And then he's indicating here things like water quality become very important. And I think the key point here is that, again, as the severity of the earthquake uh, or the event increases, the performance targets, you know, become uh, a little bit more relaxed uh, and they, they are different. So one of the tools uh, that I think is, uh, would be very important in helping to assess uh, system uh, targets and, and, and criteria are uh, simulation tools. And I show uh, an example of one right here. Now, these tools, I think, can provide a very comprehensive uh, risk profile where you can quantify damage, loss, restoration times on a system basis. Uh, and using these tools, I think you'll be able to look at these system performance targets that I just showed and be able to assess whether you can actually meet some of the requirements, you know, given uh, available uh, resources. And here in this particular slide, I show five major components, pipeline exposure, seismic hazard, uh, pipeline fragilities, risk computations, and ultimately how you display these risk results in ways that decision makers can use it uh, you know, for their purposes. And there are a number of people that are working uh, in this area, for example, Rachel Davidson at um, Delaware and Leonardo Duenas Osorio uh, Rice have also been working in these areas. So today I'm gonna really just focus on the hazard and then the, the risk results. So in order to do this, I think I need uh, to provide some sort of context. So uh, we did a study uh, a number of years ago for the uh, city of Los Angeles, where we looked at their water pipeline network. And this gives you kind of a geographic picture of, you know, the uh, the size of the, uh, the system, the network. Uh, it's very extensive. I think it may be either the most or maybe second most largest uh, uh, water distribution system in the U.S. And as you can see with all the red lines there, it's uh, there are a lot of uh, faults that uh, that would affect uh, that, that particular system. Now, one of the points that I, I want to make uh, is that um, if you're going to begin to look at ground failure hazards and their impact on uh, underground lifeline systems, it's very important that you characterize uh, these ground failure uh, hazards in ways that uh, you can begin to look at things like displacements and so forth uh, and their impact on, uh, say, for example, pipelines. Uh, one of the problems I see is that, you know, we don't have these uh, detailed soil databases to be able to characterize liquefaction, landslide, and surface rupture hazards on a large regional basis. And in particular, what we really would like to look at is, you know, vertical and lateral displacements, how accurately we can uh, begin to measure these things. And this is where I think we need a lot of attention, uh, especially when we begin to look at the regional uh, uh, performance of, uh, of these buried networks. Now, if we implement the five steps that I showed in one of my earlier slides, uh, we create what I call risk profiles. Uh, risk profile will show you some um, either expected damage or loss as a function of um, some probability of uh, the event occurring. In this case here, what I show is um, an average return period. Uh, the uh, Some of the things that I think are important is looking at the expected number of pairs that you might have uh, in a, an event. Uh, and when you begin to compare that to uh, the return periods, for example, you look at a, uh, oops, if you look at a 100-year return period, what, uh, what we're projecting here uh, are 1,500 repairs for a 500-year return period. Uh, 3,500 repairs looking at the chart on the left, which is primarily shaking, uh, and for the 2,500 year, over 5,000 repairs. Uh, the chart on the right is for ground failure uh, hazards, uh, just looking at pipe repairs that might be caused by that effect. Uh, and you can tell by the order of magnitude that there's a big difference here. Uh, and the reason being is that ground shaking hazards will affect basically the entire area. Uh, ground failure uh, effects are going to be more limited to smaller zones, and therefore the amount of damage and repairs, you know, would be less. 
But I think that when you begin to look at, you know, what happens in these smaller areas, the, the severity of the damage is going to be a lot higher. And then I like to translate this into uh, essentially a system level risk curve. And, and what you see here uh, is taking the repairs, translating that into the number of repair days that would be required to bring the system back in, into uh, operation. And again, tying it to uh, average return period. And the one thing I wanted to mention is that in, in creating this kind of curve here, you're actually creating a whole uh, event set, uh, you know, a large number or a sequence of events that could cause damage to the system. Uh, and you're trying to incorporate that into a, a broader uh, probabilistic uh, result or output. So in this case here, we're looking at... Uh, uh, say, for example, if you look at a 100-year return period, we see that the uh, number of cumulative days uh, that um, uh, you would have in terms of repair would range somewhere between two and 4,000 repair dates. Uh, and, you know, that's like if you've got one repair crew, it's a lot of time for that one repair crew to make those repairs. But when you begin to factor in and normalize, you know, those uh, repair days by the number of repair crews, you find that, for example, for a 200 teams, uh, that uh, two to 4,000 actually becomes two, excuse me, 10 to 20 days. And then finally, uh, I'd like to uh, make the point that, you know, when we begin to look at system performance goals, uh, the, the table that I had at the very beginning, this is the sort of result that you can use to, uh, to determine whether the goal that you have uh, could be met uh, based on the resources you know, that you may have to make the repairs. So here's a uh, table that shows, for example, for the 500 year return period uh, event, uh, you'd expect a little over 3000 repairs and it would take uh, essentially 200 days uh, for um, uh, these excuse me, 200 uh, repair teams to be able to make these repairs, you know, within 30 days. And if that doesn't meet the the performance goal, then you know, then you can add more uh, repair teams to reduce, you know, the the number of repair days. So this, in this way, you can begin to look at how you might uh, use a set of performance uh, targets uh, to to guide maybe your strategies either for response or for improving the, the resilience uh, of your system. So I'd like to uh, segue into uh, lifeline interdependencies. And I've got only one slide. And the reason being is that I really want to pose this as a challenge because you know this is a very important topic, uh, how uh, lifelines uh, and lifeline performance affects other lifelines. Uh, I think we, we don't really fully understand uh, the complexities there. We don't have methods or methodologies to be able to quantify that. And I think that, you know, moving forward, I think we really need to begin to do research so that we can create the sorts of tools and databases uh, for us to do these uh, sort of measurements. Anyways, I'll segue into the uh, the last part of my presentation. I want to build on some of the things that George talked about uh, in his talk. And just emphasize that, you know, this idea of forming an entity that can begin to look at, once again, uh, you know, the, the need uh, and the importance of lifelines for community resilience, uh, that, uh, you know, establishing this lifeline hub was very, very, uh, it was a very important milestone, in my opinion, and this was done earlier this year. So uh, the, the main focus here is, is, to, is to create a public-private partnership where we can begin to focus on, you know, important issues dealing with lifeline resilience. And George uh, showed this uh, particular uh, uh, slide, and I'd like to, uh, you know, call this sort of our, our holiday slide because this was the sort of our inaugural meeting uh, where we got the advisory panel uh, all together. And uh, at the same time, we also had a workshop where we discussed some very, very important issues related to, to lifeline resilience. For example, first of all, trying to understand all the factors that, uh, that affect the performance of existing lifelines. And then more importantly, to really uh, focus on what actions and what activities 
are needed in order to uh, improve the, the, the resilience of these systems, you know, moving forward. And then finally, uh, some of the recommendations that came out of that workshop, plus the additional meetings that we've had with the advisory committee uh, afterwards, uh, are um, highlighted here. For example, uh, Sistine mentioned the need for metrics and uh, methods for quantifying resilience. Uh, and this is one of the things I was hoping to get uh, at least um, um, uh, on the table here with, with my presentation. I think number two, it's very important to be able to translate this knowledge, any knowledge that we get uh, into things that we can use to better design and construct our lifelines. Uh, so guidelines, standards, and codes are gonna be very important. And then finally, uh, creating a, a better framework for us to establish, I think, long-term policies regarding lifeline safety, uh, performance, and resilience. Anyways, I appreciate uh, having the time to uh, participate in this um, uh, webinar. And I'm gonna, at this point, I'll turn it back over to, to John. Well, thank, thank you all for, for really interesting and fantastic presentations. We've gone a little long, and so we're going to ask our panelists if they would mind staying a little bit longer so that we could entertain a lot of the great questions that we got um, from our audience and from uh, and, and discussions that I think would be very interesting among the panelists. So, um, so I'm going to take prerogative and, and extend the meeting a little bit past the hour so we have a little bit more opportunity to have a good uh, Q&A session. I think I'll start off, uh, Ron, just back to you. Um, and we've, we've seen a lot of examples here of sort of federal private partnerships, a lot of discussions at that level. Uh, given what's you know recently happened in North Carolina, how do you imagine your organizations are interacting with other government agencies at the state level or the local level? Well, I, I think that there could be a, a number of things that we could contribute to, to that, number one. Uh, I think it's going to be extremely important, you know, for us to to collect information, to to be able to document and record, you know, what sort of the damage has occurred, um, what how that affected uh, things like restoration times, uh, because ultimately what we really want to do is we want to make sure that community resilience, uh, you know, uh, is improved, and in, in, and until we have you know the right information, the right data, the mechanism to measure uh, essentially activities uh, that would contribute to more, say, faster recovery and so forth. Um, you know, I think that uh, we just don't have the right tools. So I think that we there's a lot of things we're going to be able to learn from these events as well as other past events that could go into things like uh, metrics. Uh, methods that are uh, going to be needed to quantify performance. And uh, I think that the, the hub uh, could be a, a very good venue for uh, bringing together experts uh, to begin to focus on those measures. So I think that's really the one of the goals that we have is to, uh, to bring together, uh, you know, uh, parties that would reflect all disciplines, uh, different levels of um, uh, uh, governance and so forth that would help. So, Sissy, I'm going to um, throw this next question to you. Um, what do you think are the biggest obstacles to apply the way you think and describe in developing better codes and practices? Well, um, I think it's 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 a big a big challenge to codify something like that. We are, I think, looking at a new era of engineering, uh, where we are looking at decision support versus um, a factor of safety, let's say, type, type of an approach. So this is hard to make it into code, but the intent of the functional recovery um, study is the basis for creating frameworks. So um, similarly to the models of building codes that we take them and we uh, adapt them with changes regionally, Similarly, uh, we have to look at frameworks, and there are some frameworks already available. For example, FHWA has a framework for post-earthquake and pre-earthquake uh, resilience, and also the needs for collecting data after events 
of cases that were that behaved well despite what our calculations might have said, which which is a true proof of resilience. So not going after just damages, but um, I think the biggest challenge is to um, uh, to create, for example, the stuff that um, that Ron showed a consensus on what the times of recovery should be. And, uh, you, you know, starting from, uh, you know, facilities and extending that, the, fa the facilities, the buildings rely on different lifelines. So even if your building is, is designed to code, it doesn't mean that you will be able to be occupied if there is no electricity, if there is no bathroom, there is no water, you cannot go back to it. This is um, relying on, on the system, on the grid. So this is the biggest challenge, but I think we are uh, up to it and we have tools that, that can do these things. It's gonna take time. <laughs> yeah, so let me just add on to that. I mean, a lot of people have asked uh, sort of related, um, when you're looking at these cost benefits, would you expand that field even further? So how do you incorporate natural um, mm -hmm. features, you know, improvements in the natural system into those cost benefits? Do you take into account preferences from the public? Mm -hmm. um, you know, is, are there certain areas where maybe uh, one aspect of the resiliency is more important than others? Healthcare over restoration of electricity, those kinds of questions. Yeah, I, I can start replying to that since, uh, but, but my colleagues can also add uh, on that. So first of all, you know, nature-based solutions, this is where I see opportunities for geo professionals to lead things like that like for example where do we rebuild like uh, this site selection site development has to do with uh, geology with geotechnical aspects at large you know it's not only the planners or how we want it to look and uh, so uh, there are opportunities there now in directly answering the question what we have been doing in our methodology is having an aspect of resilience to be how much does your solution contribute to the reductions of CO2 emissions? And there are two ways that we are looking at that. One is obviously when you look at transportation, as an example, how much more, how many more cars are going to be longer on the road? So they're going to have more emissions. The other one is that is my solution more green? than the other one. So you may have two equivalent solutions that give you the same resilience um, results in terms of functional recovery, but one is green or nature-based. The other one has, you know, a huge footprint. So that has an evaluation. Now, how much the public has to do with it is a whole big chapter that I think we as engineers at least should do a better job communicating because if, if the public understands, that's why I'm talking about decision support systems, is to, there is not one solution that is perfect. Um, uh, there are many solutions with pros and cons, and our regular risk benefits analysis has to be expanded to aspects of that nature, of climate impact, of sustainability, of equity, of a lot of different things. So if we are able to communicate this, we can have the stakeholders be part of, of, of the answering what is the right question. Going beyond the environmental impact studies, which in general have solutions like that and all that. Um, so the other part, you know, I can pass it on to, to George or Ron, but in terms of healthcare or other stuff, this is critical um, in functional recovery is to look at assets. So a hospital is more critical than a regular residential house in, in terms of how long it's gonna take to, to, um, to recover. But if the hospital is perfect standing there, but the bridge that is gonna take you or the highway that is gonna take you to the hospital doesn't work, you didn't do a good enough job. You didn't succeed to your goal. So it's very complex and we're doing workshops. We had one recently um, and Aaron was a distinguished guest on that, a participant on what should these times be on an asset level, but then on a 
lifeline infrastructure level. And that is, um, again, it has to be looked at as a framework, I think, and then adapted for the built environment that you have regionally and the hazards you are exposed to. But maybe, Ron, you would like to add to that. I, I, I think you've done a, <clears throat> a great job in laying out, I think, the environmental uh, issues. I'd like to add just one other thing. I think social equity, I think, becomes a very important factor in establishing, uh, you know, community resilience goals. Uh, I think that, you know, bringing into the uh, picture uh, the, the distribution of populations, uh, things, you know, that I think are going to be very important uh, in terms of bringing back the recovery of a uh, community. Uh, so I think social equity, you know, is, is an important factor. And of course, the, the financial part, uh, you know, as you alluded to, and, you know, some of the insurance uh, references that you made, uh, Sissy, I think it's also going to be very key because you, you want to make sure that the, the financial infrastructure is in place, whether it's government, whether it's insurance, you know, whether it's uh, the public in general. It's there to bring back not only uh, the buildings and, and lifelines, but also the, the, you know, the businesses, you know, the, the financial structure for the, the, for the area. So I think that getting into things like supply chain management and so forth also become, you know, becomes very important factors, makes it a little bit more complicated. But, you know, the notion of community resilience is a complicated, uh, you know, issue. So it's very multifaceted, and I think some of the things uh, you brought up and then the social equity, I think, are very important. George, what do you think? Um, I, I did want to specifically talk a little bit about uh, health care and, and about um, you know, health services as a, a lifeline um, infrastructure element. And it, it, it's where I started. It's where a lot of my passion is. And I can tell you that there are lessons to be learned from this specific system, because um, I think many times we forget hospitals are essentially these days just large mechanical systems with a building on below ground. Uh, but that's not at the core of what function they bring to a community. So over the years, um, healthcare has developed a, a its own type of resilience through redundancy and also through uh, service level that, that can be uh, continued, basic service level. So what I mean by that is um, in 2003, uh, in Iraq, in Baghdad especially, there was, a, there was a brownout all across the country, blackout rolling into the city. All the maternity and pediatric hospitals lost power. Many surgical suites on other hospitals lost power. Um, there, uh, it, it was a devastating, devastating blackout. It, that showcases how you have um, healthcare facilities reliant on basic services like electricity, water, et cetera. But what is sometimes lost is what happens when that connection is broken. If you have transportation issues, that's why medical systems have, you know, medevac in the form of air ambulance, ground ambulance, sea ambulance, it is, you know, they have found ways to create redundant or other systems that can bypass any break in transportation. It's the same way with like electricity. Hospitals for the most part have redundant hospital grade uh, electrical generation systems or other things that can come to play. They also have found ways of continuing basic level services without electricity. Um, if you look at water, again, there are ways that hospitals have uh, dealt with uh, breaks in, in the water infrastructure coming in. Now, is this ideal? It is not. But the fact is, healthcare has uh, been very incentivized as a system to make sure that they are extremely resilient. Other parts of our lifeline systems have not. Your water utility is not extremely incentivized to make their systems resilient. In fact, most of the time, we don't think about water utilities until our toilet doesn't flush. So 
you know, it's the same way with energy. We don't think about energy until we can't, you know, plug in our iPhones. We don't think about telecoms until our internet. So if we as a society start looking at how do we incentivize and make sure that the other lifeline infrastructure systems um, are asked to really take that next step to be resilient, that, that is a partial solution. I think the other thing that, that we've talked about a little bit is um, that, that we need to look at a different time frame for many decisions that are being made. Life cycle costs, life cycle management of costs. Many times when buildings and infrastructure is, uh, is built, there is value engineering decisions that are made on a very short timeline. You want to save X amount of dollars so you can get in on budget doesn't take into account what that means later on or what that means after a disaster or uh, you know a significant event. So again, it's about taking a different perspective and incentivizing a different behavior. So, so one of the one of the add-ons to that then and it's sort of a follow question and thinking about uh, that broader uh, view how do you then also incorporate climate change into all this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we all understand, right? The, the, that a one in 100 year storm is not what it used to be. You know, we, we see what's happening, you know, with Helene, those communities never thought 300 miles from the, the coast that they would have suffer so much damage from this. There, there, there's, there are things that I think we have to get past uh, in, in the way that we view the world, but more so the way that we view the built environment. The built environment is not just the physical, right? Like our definition needs to expand out. It now includes a virtual and digital element. That's what Digital Twin and BIM and everything else brings. So when we look at solutions and we look at ways to deal with climate change and to deal with extreme weather events, then we need to bring in solutions from that side. And I don't believe that we currently are at the speed necessary for our communities. Oh, okay. All right, I'm gonna have one last question because um, maybe you all can stay, but I've got other, <laughs> I've got other calls lined up. Um, so will there be international events organized by the Lifeline during the Lifeline agencies or with other countries or international researchers who might join these efforts? Are there any plans to produce guidelines or documents for disaster risk assessments of Lifelines internationally? You, you know, we, we've discussed this in, uh, in our advisory uh, uh, panel, uh, and, uh, and I think that it's, it's imperative that we actually develop that international network because, you know, there are a lot of countries that have experienced, uh, in fact, we talked about Tohoku, you know, uh, being a uh, sort of triggering milestone event. And there are a lot of things that, you know, that we can learn from uh, that event as well as others. Uh, I think that if we are, you know, going to truly develop a uh, resilient sort of nation, <laughs> you know, I think we need to think well beyond uh, our country. I think we need to think about, you know, the international community. And uh, as far as, you know, uh, opportunities are concerned, uh, we really do need to think about workshops, collaborations. We need to think about uh, setting up, um, uh, uh, you know, opportunities that live well beyond one year, two years, three years, you know, this, they have to fit, I think, within these big, large international uh, initiatives uh, that are focused on climate change, that are focused on resilience, that are focused on, you know, trying to make sure that we have a, uh, you know, a, um, a reliable uh, um, uh financial business market, which, you know, requires all of the countries and so forth uh, working together. So that's that's one of the priorities that the, the hub uh, has uh, that we would like to uh, you know, begin focus on and work with international partners, you know, to make that happen. Well, well, this has been fantastic. I'm, I'm sure we could sit here and talk for hours. Um, 
I, you know, even personally, I think I've gotten a lot out of this. I'm probably going to send some my own specific questions to you by email. So, <laughs> so to look for those, it was really eye opening. They're fantastic presentations. I really thank you. The National Academy thanks you. Kagi thanks you for for uh, giving this, uh, this 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 seminar. It was it was great. Um, I'll just remind everybody that when we get around to producing the the YouTube video of this, it'll get posted and you'll get notified. So you can go back and and rewatch some of the exciting uh, parts of our presentation today. And finally, just to say the disclaimer again that any opinions, conclusions, or recommendations expressed by our panelists or anyone during the webinar are those of the individuals, and they don't represent conclusions or recommendations of the National Academy of Sciences. So with that, I'll thank everybody and, and sign off. Um, we'll hopefully look, at, look forward to the next uh, Kagi webinar. Thank you.